My name is Dan Breen and today is October 15, 2001. I am in Jackson, Tennessee at the United States Courthouse to interview Judge Hewitt P. Tomlin, Jr. This interview is taking place as part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. Judge Tomlin, uh, we're here today to interview for, as I mentioned, for the uh, Legal History Project. And about 26 years ago, you interviewed me for a job, and I thought it would be a fair uh, game to now interview you today. So I guess for the folks who are going to be watching this uh, video, if you could just introduce yourself. Well, you already have. And uh, if we're going to be formal after 26 years, uh, Judge Brian, uh, I'll say it's an honor for, to be interviewed by a, a federal judge. Uh, and uh, I just soon carry it on a first name basis if it suits you. All right. Well, you're Hewitt P. P. Tomlin Jr., is that correct? correct? And you're James Daniel Brady. All right. Hewitt, uh, again, without being too, too embarrassing for you, would you give us your date of birth? Uh, September 12, 1926. Now, you are a native of Jackson, Tennessee, is that right? A native of Jackson, uh, really more than a native. Uh, all my family, my father's family came in 1826 and I'm securing the walls of my rut. All right. But now, you weren't born in Jackson. Why don't you I tell us about that? I was not born in Jackson. That's a touchy subject, Dan. Uh, uh, my uh, mother and her mother lived here in Jackson. She, she was a widow. The, my mother's mother was a widow and quite a matriarch. And uh, when I came along, when, when my mother got married, my sister was first born in 1916. And the hospitals in Jackson, you'd recall, like the Murphy Hotel down on South Royal or the big houses up on East Main Street, they were our hospitals, so to speak. And my grandmother insisted that uh, because, who was then living in Ohio, with a fine hospital like we have now here in Jackson, built by the United Mine Workers, that uh, the service was much better there than here. So she said, daughter, you come to West Virginia to have your child. And so my mother did it. Uh, Ten years later, I came along, and my grandmother still felt like the hospitals here weren't well, efficient enough and safe enough to have a grandchild born. So she said the same thing to my mother. Again, she went to West Virginia, and again, she birthed her child. That was me. And as you know, or you don't know, because you're not as old as I am, but back in my younger days, the Civil War was, was fought verbally uh, between Yankee and, and, uh, and Southerner uh, in, the, in the public schools, in the, in the younger classes particularly. And when you played, where were you born? I said, West Virginia. said, you're a damn Yankee. And I had a couple of fights over that uh, because I was born to Southern extraction. I just happened to be uh, uh, in West Virginia at the time. So that's, uh, that's what Now, you have one sister, is that one right? One sister. And her name is? Uh, uh, Frances Tiger. Frances Tiger. She's Tiger. 10 years older than I. Okay. Now, tell, and, tell me a little bit about your, uh, your parents. Well, my, my mother. Uh, came from LaGrange, Tennessee, uh, south and west of here. Uh, my grandmother was from there as well. Uh, and my grandmother married uh, three times. Uh, we never discussed uh, the first two. But the, well, the first one we did, uh, he was a fine man. He was a lawyer from Far City, Arkansas. Uh, and uh, they moved to Arkansas when they were married. And the yellow fever epidemic was, and the malaria was so bad in the late 1700s, 1780s, uh, 1770s, uh, 1870s, I'll get it right in a minute, that they moved to Jackson. And uh, he died of malaria just after they moved here. What did your, uh, what did your father do? He was born here in Jackson. Uh, uh, his father was a lawyer, uh, but, uh, and his grandfather was, a, well, his father was a lawyer. Uh, he did not uh, practice law. He quit school in the sixth grade to go to work. Uh, there were five children in the family to help support the family. And he managed a, a, a spoke factory. Uh, that's a factory that made wooden spokes for the automobiles and trucks and buggies and caissons uh, back in the 1920s. And then he went to, lost his job in the Depression, like so many people did. Then went to work for a lumber company here in Jackson, where he worked till he retired. And your mother, was she, did she work outside the home? Was she involved in? Uh, uh, she, she finally did. Uh, uh, my mother was a wonderful lady, but she was conservative like most Southern ladies were. 
but she did something that I never thought she would do if I hadn't been her telling me about it. Uh, we had an automobile plant here in Jackson called the Marathon. And in 1903, my mother was 13 years old. Her mother bought her the second car in Madison County. There was one other car beside hers, and everything else were mules and horses. Uh, and then my grandmother, to support the family, rented out property, uh, rooms to, to rent in a, in a second house. That was something women, uh, nice women did not do uh, in that time of life. Uh, one of your, uh, is either your grandfather, great-grandfather was the mayor of the city? My great-grandfather was mayor, he was the second mayor of Jackson and served two terms in the 1840s. Now you are, are married and, and what is your wife's name? My wife's name is Joan or Joanne and uh, uh, as my father pointed out I had to go outside the state to find a wife who would marry me. All right, her name is Joanne Cook. Uh, Joanne Tom Cook. Tomlin. Mm -hmm. And uh, could you tell us how you met Joanne? Uh, rather accidentally. Uh, I was went to Washington in 1952 after the General Assembly was out and uh, I had been made uh, a member of the Board of Trustees of a legal fraternity called Phi Alpha Delta and had gone to uh, the National Convention at French Lake Springs, Indiana. It had some political battle and I joined one side of it. We lost, but uh, I was on the side not knowingly of the, of the uh, graduate power structure. And so to reward me for being a good politician or whatever, they put me on the Board of Trustees. And we had a $30,000 trust we administered for law students to get, have at least one year uh, free education in law school. So I came to Washington for a convention for a meeting of the board and I called up a, a girl I doubledated with quite a bit at Vanderbilt while I was in undergraduate school. So she said, I'm having a party and I'm, not, I'm dating two boys, <clears throat> both named John, but I'm trying to keep them straight so I want, if you, have, you could be my date. So I said, fine. So I, I showed up at the house with my ride and <clears throat> she came out front door with gardenias from one shoulder to the other that I knew that I hadn't sent. Uh, <clears throat> she came out and she was very embarrassed and said, I, one of my Johns sent me these flowers. We're going out to dinner later, but I've got your date inside. I said, that's, that's fine. I don't need a date. Well, I've got your date anyway now. So she, my wife-to-be knew that she was having a blind date, but I didn't have any idea I was having a blind date. And so that was my wife-to-be. And you all dated how long before you were married? Well, we dated long distance, uh, but the day we got married uh, was the 28th day we'd been together in our lives, and uh, I'm supposed to be, you know, conservative. Well, now, did you did you uh, uh, take your future bride to uh, to another city uh, at one point to tell her that this was Jackson? I didn't take her there for that purpose, but uh, she came down. We got close enough. She came down to visit, and we she flew into Memphis, and we spent the night with friends there in two different apartments. Keep that straight, although that would be in vogue, I guess, maybe today. <clears throat> and so we were driving over on Highway 70 uh, the next day, and we came uh, to and through this quaint little but uh, rural type of town. Again, I say it's a nice town, but more rural than Jackson, called Brownsville. And uh, so we were driving around Court Square, and my joint said, well, Where's your folks home? I said, it's on down the road a little bit, about a half mile. So uh, when we got there, I said, Joanne, we're 28 miles away. And it seemed to give us some relief. Now you and Joanne have three children. Three children. What are their names? Uh, Hewitt the third, uh, Dwight after her father, and uh, our daughter named Julia. Okay. And could I ask how many grandchildren you have? We have 12. Twelve grandchildren, and they're, what, what are they? Just what are their ages? Ages range? three through fifteen. Okay. Hewitt, if I could ask you a little bit to, <clears throat> about your uh, your education, uh, you were as you mentioned after you were born in West Virginia, you came back to Jackson. Uh, were you? Uh, I educated? came back in six weeks, by the six way. Six weeks, <laughs> not very long in West Virginia. Uh, were you educated uh, in in the school system here in Jackson? Went to the public schools here in Jackson. Uh, before I mentioned my older sister. I always said growing up that I had two mothers, and my sister's still alive, and I said I still have one of them. Uh, but she was of the opinion that I couldn't get a real good education out of the Jackson City School System, and I think she was probably erroneous. She was working in my best interest, she thought, but I think I could have. But at any rate, uh, she told my mother, and she said, well, you find a place for a brother to go to school, and we'll send him there. So uh, her husband 
was on temporary duty with the Navy in, in Boston, and sister heard of this school called Phillips Exeter Academy. And, uh, I knew none of this was going on, you see, and uh, went out and talked to the director of admissions who was during the war, because they'd take probably anybody at that time. And so his grades are good, we'll take him. So she came home and told my mother, and I had to know something about getting the transcript, so that's when I, I learned. So uh, uh, I was left there on the train from Middleton, Tennessee, and the fall of 1943. And you were how old at that time? I was just turned 17. How, how was the experience of being away from Jackson, Tennessee? Well, it was unique. Uh, I rode all the way to, to Boston on the train, changing in Washington by myself. I mean, I, no one accompanied me. And uh, took the bus from Boston to Exeter. And it was a, there was 70, about 65 or 70 of us there to, to, to play football and get start training. And uh, I, I was in a room by myself, and I cried the first two nights, and I've never been home six since. But, and, and you finished your high school uh, at finished that high school there. at Exeter. Uh, how large was Jackson at the time? It was 40, about 30, 35,000 at the most. Now, after you finished Exeter, uh, had you planned to stay up in that part of the country to go to school, or what, what was your plans as far as college was concerned? Well, uh, the war was on, and uh, everyone, even those who were not old enough to, to serve, uh, were thinking about the war, and primarily that. So I persuaded my parents to let me join the Air Corps when I was 17. Uh, you couldn't serve until you were 18, but I joined when I was 17, and over in Manchester, New Hampshire. and. Uh, I don't know, I wasn't even thinking about college. Uh, they had college boards then, that's where you sort of got qualified for, or identified for college. And on the front of the, it was a blue book type of exam, and on the front of the blue book was a place, where do you want these results sent? I didn't have any idea where I wanted them sent. So I'd heard my sister say that Princeton was the most northern of the southern schools, or the most southern of the northern schools. Well, that, that fitted me to the T. So I put down Princeton, well, they, because they were looking for people too. So I was accepted, and uh, they said, when you get out of the service, just you can come whenever you're ready. So I went there uh, later on in my undergraduate career. Now what year did you finish high school at Exeter? 44. Okay. Now, did you, go to, did you go somewhere else to, to college initially uh, after, after you finished Exeter? Yes. I was supposed to go in the Air Force and the Air Corps in uh, the fall of 44, and they kept putting the induction off because, for good reasons because the loss of air crews had... Uh, had dwindled substantially, and there was no, no great demand for, for new crews. So I came on to Vanderbilt from, from Princeton, I mean from Exeter, and uh, did five, three quarters there before I went into service. Okay. At the time that you started Vanderbilt, did you have any uh, inclination as to what you wanted to do or what type of, uh, of uh, what your major was going to be at that time? Well, I had in mind what I wanted to do from about the eighth grade. Uh, I used to build model airplanes, and I was going to Purdue University and be an aeronautical engineer. And uh, that was seen to be accepted by everybody, including me and my folks. And same, that was my ultimate goal when I went to Vanderbilt. All right, did you, uh, so you, you went to Vanderbilt for what, three quarters, and mm -hmm. then uh, three went, quarters. Into, went into the service at that time? Went into the service. And again, what branch, uh, what were you? What I was in the Army Air Corps, what they called it then, for a little less than a year. Okay. And uh, came back to Vanderbilt. Uh, in January of 46, because it was close and it was on the quarter system, and uh, Princeton was on the semester system. All right. And, and again, you, you made a transition back to Princeton at some point? I did. And how did uh, that, how'd that come about? Well, uh, it was a, Vanderbilt's a good school, and Princeton had a, probably a better reputation at the time, and a very good school. And uh, my father had finished the sixth grade, and my mother had a year of college, and they both thought that I ought to go give Princeton a try. So I said, well, I'm happy here, but I'll go give it a try. If I'm not happy, I'm going to come back to Vanderbilt. Okay. Uh, did, did you, at the time that you were in uh, at Vanderbilt and even at Princeton, did, did you have any uh, desire or thoughts about going into law? Never gave it a thought. Uh, did, did you have any, uh, I believe you mentioned that your uh, grandfather and was it your great-grandfather were both lawyers? My mother's, my, my, my mother's father uh, was a lawyer, so my, my maternal grandfather was a lawyer, and my paternal grandfather and great-grandfather were lawyers. Okay. Did, did you have any uh, uh, 
friends or, or parents of other friends of yours who were lawyers that maybe help guide you or maybe direct you into, uh, into the legal field? I can't recall any friends but one whose father was a lawyer, but uh, the answer to that really is no. Uh, I guess uh, the only encouragement, I'm being a bit facetious, but uh, my mother told me once, said, son, you ought to make a good lawyer because you love to argue so much. <laughs> okay. All right, so you went to, uh, uh, you went on and finished at Princeton, as I understand. What year did you, did you finish? I went there? back and, and finished there in uh, May of 48. Okay. Uh, again, you, you had one year out of uh, Jackson in Exeter, uh, and then you, of course, were in the, in the service, and then uh, you finish up in Princeton. What, uh, what kind of uh, response did, uh, did you get at Princeton being a Southerner as you are? Well, there were a lot of Southerners. Uh, there were about... Oh, 10 or 15, maybe 20 graduates of Exeter at Princeton. They had a had called a Southern Club where Southerners gathered together. And it was still, uh, as my sister said, uh, it was either the most Southern of the Northern schools or vice versa, but there was a Southern influence there. It wasn't quite as uh, uh, Eastern type as, uh, as Exeter was. Okay. Now, after you, you finished uh, Princeton, you, you obviously ultimately went into Vanderbilt Law School, did you not? You know, I've often wondered what happened to aeronautical engineering because I never remember making a specific consideration. I never applied to the school, never went out there. Uh, whatever happened to me and, and being an engineer because it just somehow I just got lost in the shuffle. And it was in the, the spring semester of uh, my senior year at Princeton that I said, well, I think I'll go, go to law school right. if I can get in. And so right. I applied to Vanderbilt. And that's where you went now. The you, rest is history. You uh, uh, went there in what year now? 51. 51. Oh, I'm did, sorry, 48. 48. Me. And then you finished in 51. Finished in 51. Okay. Did you uh, uh, happen to room with anybody that uh, you later had some association with in the legal field? In law yes. school? Yes. In law school I did. Right? Yes. And who was that? Uh, well, uh, your superior and good friend and my good friend, Judge Harry Welford, uh, recently retired from the Sixth Circuit. Okay. Harry Welford happened, we'll talk about that in just a few minutes, happened to also be on the district bench uh, exactly. uh, for a while and then went to the uh, Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Now, you were also, I believe, in undergraduate school and, and continued to, to remain friends with uh, Ward DeWitt, who's a lawyer in Nashville. Right? And did Ward, Ward and I uh, entered Vanderbilt Law School in the fall of 48 and became close friends. Uh, and I spent, the, my wife and I spent the weekend in his home this past weekend celebrating our 50th law school reunion. Now, uh, after you finished at Vanderbilt in 51, uh, what were you hoping to do? Were you planning to go back to Jackson, or did you have other thoughts about what you wanted to do with your legal, uh, legal education? I did. Uh, not any serious thoughts. I, I had a, have a close friend, a good friend in, in Chattanooga named Dr. Paul Johnson, whose father was a surgeon there. And, We'd go down and visit. He was in med school when I was in law school. We'd go down to Chattanooga from time to time. And Dr. Johnson had a great interest in my coming to Chattanooga. And there was an insurance company there that uh, was looking for legal, new legal counsel. And uh, Dr. Paul uh, politely insisted that I apply and come down and, and, uh, and seek the job. And because I didn't have a job and, and they were kind of hard to come by. So I did, but uh, they wanted someone with some experience and rather just someone out of law school. That was the first uh, uh, deviation. And so I came back home. Uh, I had no uh, desire to, or obvious desire to run out to some other state or some other part of the state. Uh, I did go to Memphis, and uh, there was a, a lawyer from Memphis who married a Jackson woman who was, whose father was in business with my father. He had me come over for an interview, and I had an offer of $125 a month plus one half of what I brought in. Uh, and that sounded like just not, not so much. It wasn't intriguing enough when I had to, had to pay room and board out of that because I had free room and board in Jackson. But I should have learned because the, the first month that I practiced in the fall of uh, 1951, I made $30. So I would have been quite a bit ahead had I gone to Memphis. Who, who did you go into practice with uh, when you came back to Jackson? Well, there's a very fine lawyer, now deceased, named Hearn Spragans, whose father was also a fine lawyer. And he has a, had a law firm on Court Square. And his uh, brother was a law partner of his, and he had left the practice to go on the circuit bench. And there was a vacant office there. And uh, so uh, he rented me the office for $30 a month. Uh, 
And we, I was working on, practice, working on my practice on my own, though. Okay, so, so you were you were actually whatever income you were bringing in was yours. It, it was a salary type of situation exactly. at that time. Okay. And what type of, of were you just a general civil practice or anything? Both, anything that came anything. In? Uh, Do you recall what your uh, what your first or what your, one of the earlier cases that you had that you'd like to share with us? I recall the first two cases I, that I had, and then the, the third one got lost in the shuffle someplace. But, but I. I should have, they taught me later that you should number your file 0001 to make it look good. I just put down number one and two. But the first case was a, to draw a deed on some property that my mother owned that uh, the realtor had sold, and he came to me and asked me to draw the deed. The second was on a case that was, uh, as we have passed cases on to lawyers in other states and other cities, it was passed on to me by a lawyer who had family connections in Jackson. But he practiced law in, in Nashville, and this was a boundary line dispute of some land over in Perry County, which is about two counties east of here, east of Madison County. And he, I felt like, at least he convinced me he was doing me a great favor uh, when he gave me this case. And I could see myself maybe making a $500 or so fee out of it uh, because it looked like pretty good land until I got over there. We call it uh, Blackjack Oak land, a hilly land that sort of held the land apart. And my client was, whom I won't identify, although I do remember his name, was not exactly balanced uh, because he told me once about another lawyer who had stolen a bag of diamonds from his father that was so heavy he had to carry it over his shoulder. I knew I was in trouble then. Uh, at any rate, uh, uh, we finally agreed to disagree and we decided that uh, the land was just not worth fighting over. All right. Now, how long did you uh, stay with Mr. Spragans? How long did you stay in his, his uh, office? About uh, five or six years. Uh, his son was in law school uh, in, in Nashville at Vanderbilt, and a fine young man, he's just a few years younger than I, and a fine lawyer. So when he came, finished law school, and was coming to Jackson, obviously, to practice with his father, uh, I'd gotten plenty of advance notice that uh, I needed to move, and uh, uh, there were two lawyers on, we were on the south side of Court Square, and there were two lawyers in the firm on the north side of Court Square, the name of Homer Waldup and Roy Hall, uh, and they had had uh, an unfortunate situation with a, an associate who then became a partner, and he had left the firm, and I knew from the talk around town they weren't interested in a new associate, so I again offered to rent an office from them, which they rented to me, but I was still not a part of the organization. So I moved up there in 1956 and rented the, the vacant office space where this lawyer had, had left. And they would use me some as a, as a help on the case, uh, do research, or they had something they didn't want to fool with, they gave it to me. And I still had a little practice that kind of kept things together. Hewitt, when you came out of law school in 1951, as so many of us, uh, when we start out, early on, uh, how did you feel about your qualifications to be a lawyer at that time? Well, I probably had mixed emotions. I think probably, uh, I don't have any conscious recollection of this, but I would think uh, having had the college education that I had and, and had, having graduated from Vanderbilt Law School, I was reasonably well qualified. Uh, I'd never tried a lawsuit. Uh, well, I had tried one, but that's in, uh, when I was in Vanderbilt Law School. Uh, I bought a tuxedo from a friend once to wear to the barrister's ball and the, had it cleaned and the cleaner lost the pants. And uh, he insisted that the pants he gave me were the ones that I'd brought, but they were about eight inches too short. So we filed a suit called Trover for Trousers and we got a judgment for $18.50. So that's, that's my litigation experience at that time. Uh, so I felt like I could, I was a reasonably average, lawyer with that education, but uh, uh, I realized pretty quickly that it was, uh, you had to work your way up and uh, have things given to you. Or... Did you have some uh, political aspirations early on in your, uh, right after you got out of law school? I did. I was thinking about uh, uh, lawyers and salaries. Uh, I think it's a, an appropriate time to inject this in. Uh, Homer Waldup and Roy Hall started this law firm. Uh, in 1926, and uh, this year is the, well, 26, it's been, it's almost 75 years, uh, and it's still in existence. 
uh, they had gone, one had gone to Georgetown to law school, the other one had gone to Vanderbilt to law school. Uh, they had, each had a wife, uh, each had two children. And of course, 26 was just in the, in the opening rounds of the Great Depression. So uh, they didn't have, didn't have a lot of money, they had good educations. So they agreed that they had set up one bank account. And they had one bank account, uh, probably the name of the firm, Wallop and Hall. But each family, the, the Wallop family and the Hall family and the bank account entity, operated out of that one bank account from 1926 to 1945 when they took in this new partner that left ultimately. And it, they died 10 months apart at the age of 84. And at no time, at no time, when, when the new partner came in in, 90, in 45, they had to make some other arrangements. But at no time during that, that uh, session from 26 to 45 and the time afterward, did either partner ask the other partner for an accounting? At no time did either partner offer an accounting to the other partner. Amazing story. And I've never encountered any relationship like it. And they, they exhibited that kind of, of, of honor and respect to one another. Well, they, they were totally different in personality. I'm going to go back to your political uh, involvement in just a minute, but what uh, Mr. Hall and Mr. Waller had different practices. I mean, I think as far as their, their legal practice, did they not? I mean, there were more, one was more of the office, one was maybe more of the trial, or, or at least I think maybe Mr. Wallop at least initially was more of a trial lawyer, but had to, because of health reasons, uh, uh, pull back in a little bit as later well, on. Well, there, there were different types of trial lawyers, but they were both trial, they did everything, whatever they could get and do, they did. Uh, but they were different in their approaches. Uh, Roy Roy, we call, uh, it, it's, you, the, well, what, my relationship will describe the types I never called Mr. Waldup Homer. I never felt like I could call him Homer. And I felt funny calling Roy Mr. Hall. It was always Roy or Roy Roy. Uh, and uh, Roy was a, a great people person. And he was a, a, to some degree a seat of the pants lawyer and you get the right feel. Mr. Waldup was very technical. Uh, and he could say, well, I remember here, I remember this case. And, He'd call the, the style of a case that they had uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and so I think that case ought to help us. So, but they had different approaches. But uh, Mr. Wallop was very uh, prominent with Union University, which is a nice Baptist, fine Baptist school here. He was on the board for many years, was the attorney for many years, and uh, was chairman of the board for many years. Did you consider yourself more than just colleagues with a colleague with these two gentlemen? Or were you, did you feel you were personal friends with them? Or what was the relationship generally with, with these two gentlemen? Well, I think it, I considered a very lucky relationship. Uh, I was probably 20, 25 years younger than they. Uh, but I, I had a strong, a good personal relationship. They were, they were teachers as well as uh, fellow lawyers. And they, they would give me business when uh, they wanted to pass it on. Uh, and it was just an honor to be with them. It was, uh, there never was anybody like them. There, there may have been better lawyers. I won't, I'm not saying no one was better than they, but uh, their integrity, uh, uh, their commitment to the law, to their families. And the relationship that I've just described to you about uh, having one bank account, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it wasn't good business, but uh, it, was, it was the most honorable thing they could do, and they were just looking after each other. If I could digress and go back okay. with you, uh, you personally, uh, to, the, to your early, right after you got out of law school and after you'd worked with uh, Mr. Spragans, did you decide to, to uh, throw, in, throw your name in the hat as far as political uh, matters were concerned? I did. Uh, of course, I had no, I was single. I had uh, free room and board at my parents' home. I had my own car. I did buy my own gas. Uh, and. Lawyers heard then and they're here now, probably not as much now because uh, lawyers make so much more money than they did then, but that, that the politics was a good way to get to be known. And uh, we had a, and I, that was intriguing to me, and uh, uh, I thought I'd like it. So I went to consult a, a now deceased a, a appellate court judge named Hugh Anderson. Uh, who had been a, he was born and raised here. 
a really a good judge, a tough judge. He'd been a U.S. attorney at one time and uh, had the reputation of well, uh, the corrupt war trials that were carried on by this country and others by the Allies after World War II. Uh, they tried many Germans for, for crimes of war. And they tried the Krupp family, which is a very wealthy family that made munitions and all sorts of things like that. Uh, and they were convicted. Uh, well, judge Anderson was selected as the presiding judge of the three-man judge, a three-man court to uh, try the Krupps. So I went to see him. He was a, a contemporary of my mother's. And he said, in, and I won't quote his language exactly, but he said in, in pretty crusty English, uh, you can't be a lawyer and a politician too. If you want to run, go ahead and run. Uh, if you win, go up and serve honorably and get your tail home. And that's what I did. And, and what uh, political party were you running in at the time? Uh, I was a Democrat. There weren't many Republicans around here. Roy Hall was probably one of two Republicans in Madison County. They'd, they'd point at him and said, there goes Roy Hall, he's a Republican. Uh, and you wouldn't see one for years. How many people did you run against uh, at there that were, time? There were five. I was running for two seats. Okay, and that was in what year? That was in 52. Uh, the election was in 52 to serve in 53. Okay. And you were running for uh, what position? In the House of Representatives. Okay. For Madison County? Madison County. All right. And you were elected? I was elected. And how long did you serve? It was a two-year term, but uh, it was kind of a, a freak thing. You, you had 90 days that the legislature could meet. And uh, when they met those 90 days, they were out of time. So you served two, ter two years, but the governor could call you back call, during that second year, but you couldn't call a session if you, unless you had some days left. Okay. Did you take Judge Anderson's advice? I did, because in that same period of time, I met Joanne and we fell in love, and there were some compelling reasons to get back home. Right. All right, now let's move back over to your, your movement uh, to Mr. Walter and Mr. Hall. Uh, their offices were also located downtown, is that right? Yes. And, and what type of facilities did you have when you went over to their office? Well, they were nice. They weren't, uh, they weren't quite as nice as, as Spraggins because they they, he was on the second floor of the Elks Building, which he and his brothers owned. And, uh, but this was an old building that dated back I'm probably in the 1860s, 1850s, it were, as most of the buildings were around the square and elsewhere in Jackson, for that matter. A long flight of stairs, maybe 25 steps walk up to the second floor. And uh, it was just a shotgun type of thing with uh, uh, fluorescent lights hanging from the ceiling. And, we had a heater, not a stove, but a heater in each room, uh, each of the three offices, with no thermostat. We turned them on in the morning, and uh, since I was the youngest, I'd get down on the floor and light them, and then cut them off when we left that afternoon. Now, how long did you remain in, in that facility, that building? Till, uh, till 1962. Okay. And then you moved to another facility. We, we bought, and I, uh, again, I commend these men for being so, uh, not liberal, but, but, but uh, progressive because they were in their 60s then. And we bought a building on Court Square, on the east side of Court Square, where the law firm is now today, is Wallopin Hall, and where you and I were, and uh, remodeled it and moved over there. And Roy Roy said, we're going to put on our letterhead on the level on the square. <laughs> we never did. Now, you're interesting. You had your library out in the hallway, as I recall. Yes, had a down, whole down there. Right, down there, down your, in your new building. Down one side. It was a long hall, as you know. About, the building was about 94 feet long, and the library was about oh, 70 feet long. Okay. Now, d did you uh, begin to move into a certain area of practice uh, after you were with Walterman Hall for a period of time? Uh, primarily litigation. We were, uh, had a, a good uh, defense law practice with insurance, many insurance companies. And uh, then before... I came with them after the other lawyer had left. Uh, they were doing all the litigation, and they were looking for somebody to pass some of it on to. So uh, as we'd say, our clients come to us in a brown envelope, and uh, we take whatever we get. Okay, so uh, primarily insurance defense work. Insurance defense work. Okay. Now, did you uh, go into, uh, I believe, the county attorney's uh, position at some point in time, did you We not? did. What year did. that? Do you recall what year that uh, was? Not exactly the year. Uh, I felt some comfort... Uh, and going, uh, we had some good young lawyers like Dan Brennan and others came along and made it possible. Uh, about 1972. Okay. Was, All right. Now you uh, 
when you went into that position, uh, you were, or were you at that time in the middle of the school desegregation cases? Uh, I, I was a member of the county court at the time, which uh, you met uh, once every quarter, and uh, didn't take a lot of time. And I ran for the, the county attorney retired, and I ran, was appointed by the court. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had had both a city and a county desegregation case pending, but of course, mine only dealt with the county. Not part of it. Okay. When did you become a partner with Walterman Hall? Do you recall? Became a, a, a limited, a, a, a small partner. I think twenty percent uh, in '62, and then somewhere in '65 or '6 became a equal partner. All right. And this became this. The the county attorney's fee was put in the pot like a, an insurance company fee. Okay. Now, d did you end up spending a good deal of your time in the? Uh, desegregation case? Uh... Quite a bit. It, be, it, was a, it was an active case and uh, we had two. We had the school desegregation case and then we had, uh, I call it the uh, racial reapportionment case. That's not a, that's just the name I gave it to the, distinguish it from the other case of the, uh, of the districts of the, of the county court members. What was the, uh, if you could tell just kind of the premise of the desegregation case uh, was it simply uh, uh, did it have anything to do with busing at that time I don't believe did it or not uh, no the there were I can't hear the number of districts there were let's say 15, 15 districts that you ran from that you that you could live in uh, but you ran countywide so uh, you were voted on you may live in District B or District 10, but you you own the ballot throughout the county, so people who lived in other districts than, than the one that you lived in had the chance to vote on you. And they claimed that that was, and it was later found to be uh, unconstitutional. And the school desegregation cases, what generally was the, uh, the premise as far as those uh, that particular case was concerned? Well, it was, uh, I think, the, the same or about the same that was applied throughout the South and other parts of the country that were, desegre that were segregated you know, to balance the ratio of, of, um, of white and black children in the, in the different school systems. Right. Now, this, these cases were carried on in federal court, were they not? Yes. And uh, did you happen to have uh, a reunion with one of your old uh, classmates uh, in uh, federal court on the, on the bench? Yes, uh, Judge Welford. Judge Harry Welford yeah. was the judge who was sitting. Uh, now, he had actually taken that over from another judge, had he not? Uh, he had. I, I can't recall which judge gave it up. Was it Judge McRae? Ma judge, judge McRae, yes. Uh, because, Bob McRae, Robert McRae. Uh, it seemed that the Memphis judges didn't mind too much uh, coming to Jackson, the whole court, uh, until uh, a junior judge came on the into the uh, federal judge uh, compound, and they gave him or uh, her Jackson, and they then stayed in Memphis. What was it, uh, what was it like to have uh, your former classmate uh, being the judge on the case uh, in which you were involved? Well, in all candor, I think we both conducted ourselves pretty well. We were, we were good friends, uh, had, had roomed together. But uh, uh, he made some rulings that uh, were not very good for me, but I never thought that he was doing anything other than what was right. Okay. Uh, I had a, had a horse case. It was a, a little bit different. Uh, another lawyer associated me to try it, uh, where these horses burned up in a, in a, in a barn. And it was a $25,000 horse. It was a quarter horse. And we tried it before a jury. It was a, it was a close case. Uh, we tried it before a jury and got a judgment. And uh, uh, it was appealed to the Sixth Circuit, but before that there was a a motion for judgment uh, NOV and Judge Welford granted that judgment and uh, that motion and and, uh, and killed my horse a second time. <laughs> and uh, the Sixth Circuit, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we went up there by train at that time. We didn't fly up. And uh, there was a, a judgment of affirmation on my desk when I got back from the Sixth Circuit. So it, it's, it, I, we didn't go in, didn't try to go any further. All right. But it was a, a uh, Judge Welford uh, received a time or two of some criticism from the, the press and some lawyers in Memphis about his conduct in a couple of other cases, but it was totally uncalled for. And uh, 
uh, well, all the judges uh, I ever tried a case before were men of honor, and uh, uh, he, he was, a, was a fine, was and is a fine judge and a fine person. The desegregation case continued to go on even after you left the Yes, they, they didn't need me, uh, and so when I left and, and, uh, and, and went on the bench while others carried it on. And I believe actually it's still uh, somewhat it's, it's, under it's advisement, still in, I believe. It's still in the bosom of the court. Uh, I think probably Judge Todd may have that. Uh, I'm not sure who has it. But, uh. Now you uh, uh, had some aspirations maybe even beyond the practice of law uh, starting in the early, I guess early 80s, did you not? Well, before that, uh, uh, every, everyone reacts to a different uh, set of circumstances. and. Uh, I'm a type A personality, which is not a compliment, uh, but uh, I found that I was getting more and more, feeling the stress of trial uh, more and more. And so I was looking for uh, something that might be less stressful and, as, and enjoyable. And uh, I really had a, had a strong interest to become a federal district judge. But uh, I might say, to, to put it more in focus, and I was a Democrat until 1966. Uh, I was organized as Citizens for Howard Baker in Madison County in 1964, but uh, we had a, a Democratic organization with a little money, eight people, by the way. And uh, I realized what I was missing, and my wife had been a Republican for years, all of her life. Her father used to tell me, he said, you really don't know what you are, but says, you're really a Republican, you're not a Democrat. At any rate, in 66, I switched over. And became a Republican. Became a Republican. And I believe it, at some point in time you were chairman of the Republican Party in Madison County. I was. Right? And I, I, I did aspire to be a, a federal judge. But uh, the wrong party, by that I mean the opposing party, was a party in power. And I realized that I couldn't make water run uphill and just stay where I was. All right, Judge Thomas, we're going to take a break at this time. All right. Hewitt, how many years did you practice law uh, in Jackson? Well, putting aside the time on the, on the bench from, from 51 to 81, 30 years. Okay. Could you tell us, uh, maybe in a general way, what it was like practicing in Jackson and, and in West Tennessee? It was in, I think, uh, I haven't practiced since, since 81, so I can't say much about the practice today, but uh, it was a, a slower pace, uh, uh, much more personal. Uh, the, uh, Relationships that you had with other lawyers, uh, even those that may not uh, gee and haul with you when, when you wanted them to, uh, were good. Uh, everyone, no one tried to take advantage of the other one. Uh, they would, if you had something come up, you needed continuance. If it didn't adversely affect the case, they'd give it to you. Uh, you could settle a case with a handshake, uh, work together on depositions, uh, assuming the uh, splitting the cost of depositions or of the witness, uh, and it was just a different, uh, a different pace. Nowadays, you 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 see a lot of uh, noticing of depositions and confirming uh, of this particular setting or that particular setting. Did you have to do that with the lawyers that you practice with? Rarely, I can remember. I'm not going to identify anybody because it's just a one-time event, perhaps. But uh, oftentimes. Uh, with some lawyers, you may have to give notice, or you'd try to work it out by agreement, and then uh, uh, he would be a little obstinate. Uh, you might be obstinate, and they'd give you notice, but uh, it rarely happened. It rarely happened. What was the lawyer population? Uh, of course, you, you, you last practiced in 81 uh, before you went on the bench, but what was the lawyer population maybe at, at that time or, or maybe shortly before then? Well, going back beyond, beyond that, in the, 50, in the 50s, there were maybe uh, 25 or 30 of us. And I just have to kind of guess in the, in the 80s, maybe uh, 55 or 60. Okay. But, but no large firms at that time. For the litigator in Jackson, the person who practiced primarily in court, uh, what was unique about Jackson? Well, one thing, that we, there were two things that I think was unique about Jackson. We were the county seat, first of all. Uh, and we had a federal district court, 
as long as I can remember. And I think even before I probably was born, uh, there was a district court in Jackson, which made it convenient because you didn't have to go, these other counties had to go to Memphis or Jackson to try a federal tort, a federal claim. Uh, in Jackson, I don't recall much about the old courthouse. It burned in 1934, I believe, or 1932. Uh, it was an old, very similar to the courthouse up in, uh, in Trenton with a big square clock tower. Uh, and they built the new courthouse and they had four courts in that building. Uh, in the basement was General Sessions Court. Uh, on, the on the second floor uh, were the Chancery Courts at one end and the Circuit Court at the other. And on the third floor was one courtroom that served both the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. As a matter of fact, we had a case in our firm, I don't know whether you were there or not, there were two brothers, I won't call their names, but uh, uh, in case some of their families may be around and see this, but there were two brothers litigating over some land that uh, uh, one brother had bought from the, their mother, and uh, he couldn't get the other person, other brother, off the farm. So in January, we filed uh, an eviction suit uh, in General Sessions Court, and that case proceeded all through that year to appeal to Circuit Court and then to the Court of Appeals and to the Supreme Court. In November of that same year, we got uh, an order from the Supreme Court uh, sustaining our uh, suit for, for eviction. Now, all that took place in the same building. Uh, we never left except to go back to our office or go home. But you just moved up from one, one floor to another. And I believe there's also a Supreme Court Law Library as well. In that the Law Library was there for, the, for called the Supreme Court Law Library which doesn't hold a candle of what we have today in, in uh, south of us here, uh, but anybody could use it. And uh, every lawyer had a key to, key to the courthouse uh, to go to the library. Whenever you wanted to go, Saturday, any night time, Saturday or Sunday, you had a key. You paid, I think, 50 cents for the key. You mentioned uh, right before our break uh, that you had moved uh, from Democrat to Republican politics. Uh, did you ever uh, seek an office as a Republican in Madison County? Mm. I don't recall that I did. I was, uh, I'm, I changed primarily because of, of, uh, of my beliefs as a, uh, I'm no longer a member of the church that I was, that was born and raised in, that my great grandfather was one of the founding trustees in the 1820s. Uh, but uh, churches do change like parties. And uh, I made the same observation. Uh, I left that church 25 years ago, but I left it because the church had left me in their, in their doctrines. Uh, I left the Democratic Party because their doctrines and their, and their goals were, were no longer the same as, as mine. And so I left the party, so to speak, and became a Republican. See, but you were involved, I think, in a, a number of campaigns of others uh, in the Republican uh, yes. Party. Yes, and I got involved, but. I didn't, I didn't make the change in order to get involved. Uh, it was because of what I felt, uh, and, and my wife had some influence because our views are, are quite similar, on, on, at least on politics. Okay. Did that lead into uh, your ultimate uh, appointment to the bench? I think it, it probably did had some, it gave me an opportunity. I think uh, uh, Democratic governors tended to appoint Democratic lawyers who were good lawyers. Uh, and I worked in uh, Winfield Dunn's campaign, uh, Lamar, Lamar Alexander's campaign, uh, as managers, uh, manager in Madison County, and then with Howard Baker on a district level. And when I finally did decide uh, in, I guess it was 1980, uh, that uh, there was a vacancy on the Court of Appeals. That, uh, it was time for me because I was, uh, where other lawyers may have done better or worse, uh, it was my time to, because of, of pressure and stress. Uh, they call them hot and cold reactors today, but I was a, a type A and, and didn't handle stress too well. Before we get into your, uh, into your appointment to the bench, uh, just like you to think, and maybe you might could give me a, uh, an idea of number one, who you recall as being your toughest adversary as a lawyer, 
and then secondly, uh, a particular case that you might you, that you think is, uh, is is a lawyer now. Uh, that you think was something that you remember, whether it was with fondness or, or otherwise? Well, I would say probably the, uh, some of the work that I had as county attorney on the segregation cases with uh, the late Avon Williams was some of the toughest work I had to do. I mean, toughest adversary. Tough in, in uh, well, you can, you've tried cases, I know, with people that everything is very agreeable. And you know, he wasn't unpleasant, but uh, he was uh, tenacious. Uh, I, I, there have been others, perhaps, that were just as tenacious. But uh, now Lord Adams was a very tough adversary in that he was very well prepared. Now, Lord Adams is, was a lawyer was in lawyer Humboldt at Humboldt. the time. Uh, it's Lord Adams, Jr., who's now retired. But uh, you didn't dare defend a case that he was prosecuting as a plaintiff's lawyer or defending if you're on the other side. If you, if you weren't fully prepared, because you know he was going to be prepared. Mm -hmm. He was smart. Uh, he had some time in the military. He gave him some good discipline. And, uh, but it was, it was fun uh, to try cases against him. And we both enjoyed it. And we're still good friends. Right. In terms of, of moving towards uh, your, your uh, seeking the uh, appointment to the bench, what, what uh, at that time, and I assume it may be similar now, what did you have to go through in terms of, of applying for or seeking that position? Well, that, it's a, 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 the original appellate court nominating commission had been formed at that time. Uh, but prior to that, back before the commission, uh, the governor would appoint you and you'd, you would serve until the next, uh, uh, until two years thereafter, and your name was on the ballot. But uh, in this case, they have an appellate court nominating commission. The, the composition of, of same has been changed by uh, political action in the last uh, three or four years. Uh, you would be, you'd file an application uh, with, the, with, the, with the commission and then uh, have certain recommendations and then they'd have hearings, uh, generally speaking, in the Western District in Memphis. And you would appear and uh, actually someone would, would appear on your behalf uh, and would make a motion that you be appointed and then people would speak on your behalf. And then the next day they would interview uh, each applicant uh, privately uh, and uh, ask him all sorts of him or her all sorts of questions. And this is a nominating the, committee that would be asking the questions. Commission, yes. Okay. And would that committee recommend so many names or so many individuals to They'd the governor? They'd submit three names to the governor. Okay. And the governor had had the chance or had the right to accept or reject to accept one of those any one of those names and make the appointment or to reject all three and send the commission back and say, come up with another, another panel of three. That which rarely happened. And this was in the latter part of 1980? or This was in uh, October, November of 1980. Okay. Uh, at the time, who was governor? Uh, Lamar Alexander. Okay. And you were in the final three at, uh, that the, went to the, the governor? In the final three. And when did you find, uh, find out uh, you were going to be appointed? It was sometime around Christmas of, uh, of that year. He'd been in, in Japan. And uh, I don't know whether it was in San Francisco or Memphis, wherever they landed, but uh, John Parrish, who was the governor's uh, PR man, uh, called me and, and uh, said that the governor wanted, me, wanted to appoint me to the Court of Appeals. And John Parrish used to be a, what, a reporter with the Jackson Sun? Reporter with the Jackson Sun. Okay. Uh, and I'm assuming you uh, responded affirmatively when, when you it were called. It took me about two minutes. All right, when were you sworn in? Uh, sworn in the, the latter part of January of uh, 81. Okay. But I might say this, uh, it, was a, it was a bittersweet leaving because uh, I, was, uh, I couldn't have been happier with the firm I was in. Mr. Walter and Mr. Hall were still there some. Uh, of course, you were there. Uh, uh, David Former was there. And there were others. So it was a, it wasn't, it was hard leaving something to go to something that I wanted. Had Mr. Hall, uh, when did he, had he left to go to the legal services at that he had, time? He retired, if, if you recall, 
about six years before that to um, go to work with a uh, West Ten with something I don't like West Tennessee Legal Services for the agent. Okay, and he started. I think he was he, kind of the first he, he person to, that. to uh, head that, was he not? Uh, and that was that was his bent. I mean, it was a matter of helping the the elderly, and I think. Uh, you all re we all realize, and at some point in time you will too, after 20 or 30 years from now, uh, that uh, it's time to move on to something different. You mentioned some of the people that you left behind, and I'd, I'd like to uh, at least you let you comment. D uh, David Farmer uh, was the, the next person that came into the firm after you, I believe. Yes. And, and he ultimately became a partner. Uh, David left the firm in, uh, I believe, 86. Where did David go? He came on the Court of Appeals. With you? With me. So he, he was able to work with you until your uh, ultimate retirement. Right. Okay. Uh, and he was appointed, I believe, by Governor Alexander right. as well. Alexander as well. Okay. Uh, Jim Todd came uh, to the office in 1972, uh, ultimately becoming a partner, and he left in uh, 83, and where did he go? He went to the circuit bench. Okay. And he was appointed by, uh, I believe, Governor Alexander as well? Alexander as well. Okay. And to show you how, how things work, I'm not going to call the name, but uh, we had hired a young lawyer uh, in 80 to come to work in 81. Uh, and it was all set. It was a done deal. And we got a letter in January of 81 from this lawyer saying that because of personal family situations, et cetera, that I won't go into, uh, I'll not be coming to Jackson. And uh, thank you for the position, but uh, I'm going to stay in wherever I am now in, in Middle Tennessee. So uh, within weeks of that, uh, two or three weeks, uh, uh, Jim came in. Jim some, Todd. Someone, Jim Todd. Someone either he came and someone sent him to us, uh, told us about him. Uh, he was uh, going to night law school at Memphis State and teaching at, uh, uh, at a boys' prep school uh, in Memphis. And so uh, we hired Jim, and the rest is history. And this was 1972? Yeah. Okay. And he, uh, after he went on the circuit bench, then was appointed by, I believe, President Reagan to the district bench. District bench, correct. Okay. And now is a chief judge of the Western District of Tennessee. Exactly. Okay. Um, I'm, 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 I'm proud of proud of our stable. Uh, one you haven't mentioned, you would, probably would have if I hadn't butted in, uh, is Ed Bryant. Uh, Ed walked in off the street looking for a job. He was a captain uh, teaching con law at West Point, and he was wanted to get back. Uh, his mother was a widow. Uh, he wanted to get back home to help look after her and just wanted a different environment. He came in one November and applied for a job. And before he went home at the end of his, his uh, Christmas leave, he had a job. Then he came back, I think, uh, February or March, and went to work for us. Now, for those who may not know Mr. Bryant. Uh, Ed Bryant uh, at one time was a uh, U.S. attorney in Memphis. And uh, then he ran, for, he was uh, uh, fired with honor by Bill Clinton. Couldn't happen by, from a nicer guy. Uh, and uh, then he ran for Congress and was elected. And he's been, he's not our congressman because he represents the district just to the south of us. That's what, is that the 8th, 7th district? I think it's the 7th eighth, district. 7th or 8th, one of those. Eighth. It's in Germantown and then he runs from several German, different counties. From Germantown to, to Clarksville. And I believe he's uh, either close to or about his fourth term, if I'm not mistaken, right. as a congressman from that area. He was one of the 13 managers on the impeachment proceedings. Man of great integrity and great ability, like the rest of you guys. Let's go back to you and, and go into the bench. Uh, who was on the Court of Appeals? And, and, and again, for those who may not be aware, was this the Western Section uh, Court of Appeals? It's the Western Section. It's called the Western District by other places, but it is the Western Section of the Court of Appeals that has jurisdiction on, on appellate work between the Mississippi River and the Tennessee River. And who else was on the court at the time that you came on in 1981? Uh, uh, Paul Summers, uh, Sr., uh, Kirby Mathern, and Charles Nairn. And who was the presiding judge or the chief judge at that uh, time? Kirby Mathern was the presiding judge. Okay. Judge Mathern was from Brownsville? From Brownsville. Right? And uh, Judge Nairn was from Memphis? Memphis, and right. And Summers is from Somerville. Somerville. He's 
also been one of our interviewees uh, before you. Uh, you were the, the, the new kid on the block, so to speak. Uh, how was the transition from the practice of law to being, to being the senior partner of the law firm, of, of, of a law firm in Jackson, to being the, the new kid on the block, so to speak, uh, on the appellate bench? It was quick. Uh, I was sworn in on a Friday, and they told me, said, uh, we're glad to have you. Said, uh, we were sitting Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Says, you're getting all six cases Monday. Uh, so it was a quick transition, and I'd got all six cases. They helped me, but I still got all six cases. But that was because they'd been without a judge. Uh, I filled a vacancy. Uh, it was fortuitous for me, but nonetheless, it was tragic. Uh, by a young man named Watkins Ewell from Dysburg, who was only I thought, about 43 or 4 years old. And he had a heart attack on the bypass here in Jackson and died. And so I was left a vacancy. That was a vacancy that you took. Yeah. Okay. But he had a very fine reputation. Now, uh, does the western section only sit in Jackson? I mean, is that the only place that you all would sit, or would you at times have to travel? Well, uh, we would only sit in Jackson in the beginning. Uh, and they, they were run by sort of like three autonomous courts. Uh, and I say that the three of us, uh, you and this young lady here, uh, who can't be seen on camera at the moment, uh, represent the three district, the three, three grand divisions of Tennessee, east, middle, and west. And they didn't try to balance a caseload. So if there's an easier caseload in, in west Tennessee, which there was, uh, then we got the land yap. But we didn't have to, the, the judges in the other two districts, other two sections, uh, were getting more cases than us. So it finally worked out before I came on the court that, uh, that that dog didn't hunt anymore. And has something had to be done to balance the caseload. So they started working on a system after every uh, trimester. Uh, they would balance the caseload mathematically and then just do a mathematical uh, figuring. And then whoever had the least cases would go to either Middle East, Tennessee, and take some more cases to balance it up. Uh, there was some, I think, some little friction in some earlier judges uh, by this happening. but. Uh, but it was a good deal and it for us, and it, it, it should not have been that way for very long. So uh, we did have fewer cases in either Memphis, either Nashville or Knoxville. Nashville being the head of the middle section and Knoxville the head of the eastern section. So our section would go to whichever had the fewest cases, or the most cases rather, uh, every three months and uh, take some of their cases, hear them and then and bring them back to Jackson and work them up. and and file them. So you were, you probably were to some degree as well known in maybe middle and eastern Tennessee as you were in even the western section. Yes, we were. As a matter of fact, I, I don't know, they never said why, but sometimes the, the middle, middle section lawyers were glad to see us. I, uh, we, won't, we won't go into that uh, at this point. They never said why, and I, I never asked why. When you went on the bench in 1981, were you provided any type of uh, particular training? Or did, I mean, were you sent anywhere or, or uh, given any special instructions in terms of just how to be a judge? I'll say no. Then I'll hasten, I was not given any. I hasten to say this should not reflect on uh, my senior colleagues because uh, they were very capable, but it was just something it wasn't done. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that those who came on before me, uh, it wasn't done. It was just presumed that you knew how to be a judge and you, you could get some books on how to write opinions. Uh, but it, it was difficult uh, to make, well, the transition wasn't difficult, but it, it was just, it, you just went by the seat of your pants. So much so that uh, when, when Kirby Mathern and uh, retired and Paul Summers retired in 1982. Uh, and we had two judges come on at the same time. Uh, uh, judge Crawford, who is now presiding judge. And Frank judge, Crawford. And Judge uh, Alan Hyes from Henderson. And uh, Charles Nunn was our presiding judge. And he was a, a go-getter. And so he talked to us and uh, talked to me and he and I decided that uh, it would be helpful if we did something uh, with the new judges. And so uh, we had some pleasure with business and took them down to Pickwick one day. 
and spent the day on the river. And we worked up a, a sort of a sheet of, I'd cover this and, and Charlie would cover this and explain it to them, to, which I think helps some. So you, in, in, in a matter of almost a year, maybe a little more, you went from the new kid to the second in command, so to speak, uh, of the Western section. Right, exactly. Well, when the, old, the two older ones took out at the same time. Right. In traveling across the state, uh, did you get a sense of a different type of case that was coming to you from, say, some of the other sections versus the Western section? You did, and that, that made, it, it made it, we enjoyed it. I mean, I, uh, I really enjoyed it. I sometimes took my wife, uh, not at state expense, uh, and uh, I had friends in Nashville, and we made friends in Knoxville, but you had a lot of government, state government cases in Nashville, for one thing. Uh, I think we had more industrial type cases out of uh, Knoxville, because Knoxville uh, was more highly industrialized early uh, than, uh, than Nashville, in my opinion. So it, we had a good variety. And, uh, and, and different, uh, in Knoxville, East Tennessee is, is a bit different in, in some respects uh, from middle and west, particularly West Tennessee. Uh, we had many of the counties in East Tennessee were fought with the Union during the Civil War, whereas in, the, in the West Tennessee they were all, except for a few, couple of counties on the river, all with the Confederates, uh, different, just different personalities. So it, it was fun to, to, to do this, and so you'd, you'd see different people and get to know different people. In terms of, uh, of the personnel, again, uh, you had another, not as nearly as, or as quick as the first two, but uh, ultimately had another change. Judge Nern retired as well, did he not? Yes. And when did he retire? He retired in 1986. Okay. And what did that do for you in terms of, of your uh, pecking order, so to speak, on the court? Well, I, I became the, the presiding judge, uh, like it or not. <laughs> in five years, basically. In five years. Okay. And then again, you had somewhat of a, uh, a distinction, maybe, or a treat uh, from your standpoint of having your former law partner as, your, as another one of your just That's judges. Right. He was the first one who came on, I think, after I... Yeah. Uh, David Farmer. David, David Farmer. So he, he, he became the new person, so to speak. As, right. As well. uh, generally, how are cases assigned, and, and I'm certainly using from your vantage point, uh, how are cases assigned uh, to the other judges of, of your section, of, your, of the Western section? You could use, and did, we did use, uh, uh, different methods. Uh, sometimes we drew. Uh, uh, sometimes we just let the cases follow. Uh, the judge just assign an order, set up an order, and let it go one, two, three, or A, B, C, or mix it up. Uh, but they were they were not assigned until uh, well, most of them were assigned or pre-assigned uh, at the time, just before we sat. Would you have pre-argument and, and and again, I'm. I'm presupposing that those who will be watching this, but obviously with Court of Appeals, uh, you, you have arguments, you have oral arguments most of the time uh, with the lawyers. Uh, Correct. Do, do you have, did you have pre-argument uh, meetings or conferences? Like pre-conference, like a yes, pre-conference hearing? Yes, sir. Uh, no, we didn't. I'm not saying we never did, but uh, there were, the appellate courts were either called hot courts or cold courts. Uh, the cold court, uh, I'm not sure that any district, any section ever sat that way regularly, but cold court would sit and, and would not read the briefs beforehand. They walked into the, to the case cold turkey. Uh, we never saw the logic in that because we didn't think it made us biased, but it told you, you learned more about the case. Uh, we had, our law clerks would give us uh, briefs of the, of the, a brief of the brief, a trial brief, and then we would, we would read, uh, I won't say we read every brief every time. Uh, sometimes uh, it wasn't necessary, sometimes you didn't have time to read them, it was so, so long and important. We would read the briefs, and so we knew as much as the briefs could tell us uh, about the case when we heard them. Occasionally, uh, I know I did, and I think the others did too, would read part of the record. If it was a complex case and there was a point you really wanted to be clear on. And that helped, but so we made it possible 
we thought, to answer, ask more intelligent questions uh, of the lawyers. They had 15, a minimum of 15 minutes and a max of 30 minutes uh, to argue, to each side to argue their cases. You could have more time if you filed a petition for it and showed justification for it. Did you, after your arguments, after the, the number of arguments you might have in a given session or a given day, would you come back with your fellow judges and, and discuss what you had heard or, or the issues maybe that were of, of maybe interest to you or the other judges? Yes. The normal, normal procedure would be this. that You'd hear four cases in the morning and two cases in the afternoon. If the time permitted, uh, if we had to say 30 minutes before lunchtime, so we had to be back either at 1 or 1.15. Uh, we'd sit down and discuss the cases that we heard that morning. Uh, and sometimes you can you can read them and, and after, after having read the briefs and heard the arguments, uh, without deciding this is what it is, point blank, uh, you could virtually tell the way that the case was going to go. Uh, occasionally you wouldn't have any idea what you're going to do with it. And so you just kick around how you think the case ought to be decided and and uh, that didn't decide the case even though all three says uh, would say I think I ought to go for the plaintiff whoever wrote the opinion might get into it and read the record and said fellas we were all wrong this is what the evidence really shows because sometimes the complete evidence wasn't stated because of time constraints other things so I mean, you would have an, at least an, a genuine idea but again you'd have some cases that I'll, when, when I get the opinion written, I'll send it to you, and that's the first I'll know what I'm going to do. Would there be an occasion, you as a presiding judge, because you were presiding from 85 to when? When did you? Uh, from 85 to 95. To 95. So 10 years you were presiding judge. Would you at times say, I want to write the opinion in this case, and I'm going to, to do that myself? No. no. Uh, you didn't get a chance to choose the case. If someone could say, if it fell to someone and there was some reason for a conflict, uh, I'd rather not write it for, for thus and so reason. If it was a good enough reason, then so we just swap. Well, Danny, you take this case and, and Frank take this case or whatever. Yeah. But as far as, as picking a case, uh, the last thing that you'd want to do is to, is to do selective assignment. Okay. And it, it I want to write this case. I'm, I'm good at, uh, uh, at bad line disputes. And let me write this case. Well. You, whoever writes it, you can help him out with it, but uh, if you have some special knowledge. What would be, what, in terms of percentage-wise, what would be the uh, largest percentage of the type of case that you would normally hear? In the latter part of that 10-year period, 18-year uh, period, uh, domestic relations, uh, I'd say 30 to 40 percent of our cases were domestic relations of some type, if not divorce, custody, Division of property, uh, alimony, mm -hmm. visitation. Uh, as far as your involvement in oral argument, were you a person that liked to question the lawyers, or would you try to, to divide that up with just listening to the lawyers, or what, what would you say your uh, forte was on the bench? Uh, if you if you talk, ask Judge Crawford, who's now the presiding judge of this of that section, uh, he'd say I asked too many questions. And he'd try to he try to kick me though and said, "Be quiet, Tomlin," uh, in a good good humor way. But uh, I believe you learn a lot by asking questions. Uh, you can either bring out uh, the strength of the lawyer's case that he's got a good point, or the weakness of the case, and that not only helps you but the the other judges can see it as well. So. It makes it easier to get to the lick log. We, assuming that uh, Judge Crawford was correct in his assessment, maybe that you did like to ask questions, would that cause... He was, he was correct in that. I, I disagree that I asked too many, okay. but uh, he could be correct about that too. Would that, uh, would that cause you or the other judges to maybe be a little more lenient, allowing the, the lawyers to, to argue a little longer or to present their position a little longer than your normally assigned time frame? If we took up too much time, uh, the presiding judge, whether it was me or Frank uh, Crawford, would say, well, we've used uh, uh, four minutes of your time or five minutes for argument, uh, so uh, we gave you some, some more. We said to the other side, you can tack on three or four minutes to your argument as well if you need it. Okay. Now, you uh, 
when you w went to the bench in 81, had the new uh, Supreme Court building, Court of Appeals building, been constructed at that time? Yes. Okay, so you were the beneficiary of that new facility instead right. of being on the third floor of the, of the courthouse. Um, how many law clerks uh, were you assigned? You're given, we were given one law clerk. Okay. Some uh, courts in other sections of, other, uh, of the government uh, get more, but we got one. Supreme Court, I think, had maybe two. Okay. What was your, uh, in, in selecting, you, and did you have a law clerk that would stay with you uh, one year at a time, or did you sometimes have him two years, or, or how would you uh, go about selecting your clerk? Well, I'd go about selecting the clerk. It's just sort of, you did it by the seat of your pants again. Uh, uh, you'd notify the law schools. Uh, generally, I notified uh, University of Memphis and UT and Vanderbilt that I was interested in, in employing a clerk for the next year. And it, uh, uh, they have a system where they post names. Uh, and then I would go and visit the school. And I'd have them send, the school send me resumes of these these people, I would name the ones that I wanted to hear and see. And then I would read those resumes and, and notify the school that I'd like to come up and, and interview. Uh, they each have facilities where they would interview the, the, the prospective clerks. Uh, and I got in the habit of taking my present clerk with me because uh, most of my clerks came from UT and Memphis State. And they would, would uh, graduate. Uh, and so whether they knew my clerk or not, uh, it helped. To, uh, and they'd, and they'd, I'd say ask for a feedback. I said, "What do you just tell me? What do you think of them?" Did, did you uh, uh, hire your law clerks for more than one year generally, or was it usually just one, one year? One year. Okay. It's hard. Uh, uh, it works both ways. Um, all my clerks were, were out of the eighteen that I had. Uh, maybe one or two were not up to what I thought they were going to be. By the same token, I remember when. Uh, I sort of rated mine, and I called number one, and number one said, so I've taken a job with so-and-so, and I called number two and something else. I got down to my, about my fourth choice, and he turned out to be as good as anybody ever was. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, What, uh, just out of curiosity, what uh, caused you to maybe emphasize or to be uh, more selective with the two schools other than Vandy? Well, I'd, I'd have to answer that by saying I thought that, that Vanderbilt was more selective. Uh, and uh, I didn't get as much interest out of Vanderbilt. I had uh, see, two clerks from Vanderbilt in 18 years. Okay. And, uh, uh, and I just, after a while, it was, it was obvious. And, and not many Vanderbilt clerks came to our court. And, uh, I never asked why. You all sat from time to time in Memphis, did you not? I mean, mm -hmm. on, those, on, on, on occasion. Okay, we we'd sit at, uh, at the law school at Memphis State. Okay. We sat one time, I think, in Nashville at Vanderbilt, and then uh, two or three times at, at UT in Knoxville. I think it, we were talking about this a little earlier about the Constitution actually does designate, though, Jackson as one of the places for the courts to meet, the Supreme right. Court. To it says the court shall sit in Jackson, Nashville, and Knoxville. Now, it didn't say that they, they shall not sit any place else. But as I mentioned in our break, uh, the transportation in West Tennessee was, this is in the, in the 1837 Constitution, as I recall. Uh, the Indians were still around. And uh, had dirt roads, uh, the railroads finally came through. Uh, but it was just, it was an accommodation to the litigants, I think, and the lawyers, uh, as opposed to either rewarding Jackson and penalizing Memphis that they, they had them sit here. When you went on the bench and during the time period that you were uh, sitting, did you find your relationships uh, with your fellow lawyers change uh, by reason of you being a judge? Uh, definitely it did. And I may have been uh, more of a cause of that uh, than, uh, than not. Uh, when I was a lawyer and was in appellate court in the courts of, of the of the state and federal government. Uh, I mean, I didn't. I held back trying to establish a relationship with with the judge or judges. Uh, there was a judge here in, in the Western District, uh, Judge Marion Boyd, uh, and uh, he was a, a different person, a great guy, 
And he would always, I'd come to the courtroom and he'd call me up to the bench and speak to me while the trial was going on. But, he, but, he, but it, didn't, it didn't help me with, his, with any case. He wasn't, he wasn't doing me any favor. He just was that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I tried to, to be particularly careful. And uh, uh, I missed the, the relationships, but I, uh, I didn't do it to a fault, but I, I think there was, was a, different, a difference for sure. Over the 18 years, how did you see the court, the appellate court, uh, the section that you were on, or the entire court, how did you see it change? Hmm. We had more cases that we could, uh, we could handle them, but it took us longer to do it. Uh, that was a change. Uh, we could have used more clerks. They've gotten two clerks since I went off the bench. Uh, I don't mean this as a criticism of the court. I think that the Supreme Court uh, became more uh, political in that they began to have hearings throughout the state to, uh, to let the people understand what the court's about, and maybe that's the way to do it. But you know, I don't see the U.S. Supreme Court moving from from state to state, and that's the most important court in our land by far, or the or the district courts, uh, I mean the circuit courts of appeal. So, but that's the way they saw it, and uh, uh, they're the Supreme Court. Could you point to? Uh and this may be a little unfair, but uh, to some degree, could you point to a case or a series of cases that you felt from your standpoint as, a, as an appellate judge were the most challenging to you? I had a zoning case in Knoxville that was very challenging. Because uh, it affected, you know, zoning always affects the rights of people to use their land. And this was a big uh, uh, trash dump case, land use. And, would have negative effects on a lot of land around it. No persons, but the, the, land, the landowner. And that, uh, that I mean, it took me nine weeks to write the opinion, so, uh, uh, and I wasn't, I wasn't fast, but I wasn't that slow. Uh, then one or two others that, that bothered me, uh, but uh, one interesting case, we had a lady from, from Memphis, lady lawyer, cute little lady in the 60s, maybe 70s. I can't think of a name. I should have researched it, but I didn't. Uh, but she was representing a man who wanted to change his name. And his name was, was uh, well, it's a matter of court record, so I'm not talking about anything, but it was George something Bell. And he, he filed, she filed a petition for him in the, uh, I guess it would be under the, uh, I don't know which court it was. It was either the Chancery Court or maybe the, uh, probate court, I think it was a probate court, to change his name from George Bell to Bell. And the rationale was that he was a little heavy and that people called him Georgie Porgy, and he didn't like that. So this lady, gosh, she was a sweet little thing, uh, filed an appeal and it came before our court and uh, she argued the case and she had a hat on with a, a feather so a big feather, and when she'd turn up, move her head, the feather would, would quiver a little bit. So we'd ask her questions about why. Why do you, why do you want to do this? Why, why, do you, why is it, it uh, we pointed out that, well, Bell, how is it going to, have, how is it going to be on his Social Security card? They're not going to accept Bell or his driver's license uh, or his draft card. Uh, and. Uh, how could it just wasn't a practical thing to do? And she looked up at us and she said, Well, said, Jesus only had one name. And that put, sort of uh, closed the door in any, any arguments we had. And so we, uh, what had happened below, the, 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 the trial judge had uh, granted permission, but, but he called him back in the next morning. And overnight he said he'd reversed himself and he denied it. And that's what perfected the appeal. So we, uh, we reversed the trial court and, and, that, and changed his name to Bell. So I guess it's wherever Mr. Bell is, it's still Bell. I asked you a little earlier about some uh, lawyers that you may remember uh, having practiced against or practiced with during your uh, time as a lawyer, as a, as a practitioner. 
any particular lawyers that you that kind of jump out at you as far as ones who have appeared before you uh, during your 18 years on the bench? In what respect? Well, just uh, either ones that were uh, in their mannerisms or their abilities that were just uh, uh, outstanding practitioners, the ones that uh, you just always say that person was always well prepared or was, a, was a, certainly an example of a fine attorney who appeared before you. Well, I probably, or unusual, <clears throat> maybe some unusual. Uh, I probably could remember. Uh, I sat on, I think, about uh, 800 cases. Uh, I could remember some that were outstanding. But I fear uh, to name them because uh, I'm sure there were others who were almost as good, if not as good. But uh, I'm acting on my own recollection. And uh, I'd might leave somebody out who would hear this and who's, who's really as good as the, the next person. That might have been a little of an unfair question. But no, it's, it's not. You've uh, got that privilege. <laughs> what about your law clerks now? You, you said you had 18 over your, your career. Uh, have you had some of them come back to practice in front of you? Or that came mm -hmm. back while you were on the bench? I have. And uh, did they, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, in terms of those that you felt uh, good about, I mean, they they uh, prove right in terms of or prove you right in terms of your assessment of them while they they uh, were your clerk. They've done well. I, I'm very pleased with. A, I'm very fortunate to have had the clerks that I did because the, the clerks play a big role uh, in the judge's work. Uh, I would, for the most part, they would write drafts for me, but I would, for the most part, redraft my opinions uh, after seeing what they've done. And they disagree. We had good disagreements. Uh, there's, uh, there's one. Uh, it's just, I think it's kind of funny. Uh, uh, we were in, in, in Knoxville, and uh, we were trying to. It was a case, a Chattanooga case, and it had to do with with a suit for, for specific performance, which is uh, is generally granted when uh, to enforce uh, a transaction when. Uh, one party who has the property changed his mind about selling it, and, that, and, the, and the buyer wants to force him to have it, to sell it to him. But this involved where well, uh, uh, the buyer declined to buy some property that was unique. And so uh, the trial court uh, denied uh, SP, and uh, but I was talking with my clerk afterward because the clerks don't sit in with, on the conferences. Uh, he says, what are you about this so-and-so? And I said, well, uh, we're going to reverse the, the trial court and, and grant specific performance. And, and uh, it saw, he was really kind of leaning the other way pretty hard, and he said, he said, you can't do that. And I said, like hell I can't. <laughs> and then we laughed and, and uh, it was just a, a spur of the moment thing, but uh, uh, a good honest disagreement. A good honest disagreement. Yeah. Again, looking back over 18 years, have you uh, on the bench? Uh, have you seen a change in judicial philosophy in a general stand, from a general standpoint? Let me see. That. I'm. I'm my memory is going to, going to stop with uh, uh, with 98 when I was retired as, as senior judge. Uh, I've not read but one or two opinions since and except on cases that I have worked on as a special judge. Uh, I think there's a liberal and conservative are hard words to define sometimes and, and say what you're trying to say. Uh, I think there's at the appellate level, uh, maybe more so at the Supreme Court level, because there are three different sections and they, they've got different philosophies somewhat. Uh, a more, I don't know how to use the right word. I would say liberal, but that can be a liberal. An activist? Uh, uh, activist, yes. There, there have been a more activist court. Uh, I'm not saying that's good or bad. It's a, that's a matter, matter of opinion as to whether it's good or bad. It's either good or bad but it depends upon the person making the observation. I think they've become more activist. 
uh, more involved in the. Uh, I, we always felt like when I was on the court that the Court of Appeals uh, the, had certain rules to go by, and that it was a uh, it the Court of Criminal Appeals, uh, separate courts, and they have some autonomy. Uh, uh, I think that's been maybe, in my opinion, been lessened. And there again, I could be pr be proven wrong or found wrong, but that's my opinion. What about the caliber of lawyers who have appeared before you? Uh, have you felt that that has maintained a good quality, or have you seen it maybe lessened or maybe improved over the time well, you've been on the bench? You always had, you didn't have the same, uh, uh, every lawyer wasn't a Mark McGuire. Uh, so you had, you had variations in, in quality. You had some that, uh, uh, who weren't well prepared, weren't well trained, didn't have the, the talent, and you had others who could hit a home run off of any pitch. So uh, I don't recall any, any, any real change over, that, over the period of time. You had, always had some good ones and some who weren't so good, and they probably thought they had some bad judges and some good judges. A lot of people talk about particularly lawyers uh, who either have retired or maybe been away from the practice by reason of being on the bench uh, have had pause to think about, you know, would I do this over again? Would I go back into the practice uh, if I was starting over again? Have you given thought to that question or have you had that issue? And, and if so, what, what, was your, what would be your thinking? Uh, without trying to point fingers at, I uh, certainly wouldn't point fingers at people, but uh, I feel like that the, that the overall quality of the, of the bar that I know it, as I know it, and it's only the Tennessee bar, uh, has changed. Uh, I think this country has affected, it's not just the lawyers have changed and, and their, their modus operandi is different. Uh, I think this whole country has changed. Uh, uh, our moral values, I, th I believe, have changed. Uh, I think we've become more materialistic where uh, things and, and homes and money, uh, you know, people are building trophy homes, they uh, criticize, perhaps sometimes it's well founded, uh, men who leave their wives and marry a young girl, much younger, attractive, with his trophy wife. People are building trophy homes today when they don't need a home like that. Uh, in any sense of the, of the word, but they have the money and they want to be seen with a, with a big home and uh, be known to have a big home. We've got, we've become, I'm not saying that, that this is everybody but me, it's, uh, I'm part of that society. Uh, material things become more important to us. Uh, and so the overall decline in moral values, I think has affected uh, the quality of the person's word, his commitment. As I said, uh, uh, well, I wouldn't go back because I'm 75 years old and I don't want to get in the, in the rat race. I would not advise, uh, I have three children. Uh, I never tried to persuade one to become a lawyer. I saw a case where a good friend of mine's father was a prominent surgeon and he always spoke of his son, called him John, becoming a doctor. John didn't want to become a doctor until he flunked out of med school and decided three years later he wanted to go back and be a doctor. He, he talked his way back into med school and did a bang up job. So I didn't try to persuade. Uh, they, my kids knew what I did. Uh, and, uh, but my daughter became a paralegal. That's about as close as anybody came. But I would, I would not, I think I would overall uh, discourage my children from into the practice of law today. And I say it regretfully, but I, that's my honest feeling. Have you seen, and maybe it was a follow-up question, have you seen, again, in your position as an appellate judge, the ethical aspects of the practice change and, and lawyers who come before you maybe in certain circumstances might uh, reflect a, a change in, in the ethics among lawyers? I have sensed it. I can't say that I, I, I may remember one case uh, but that wouldn't be a, a fair example to have just one case. But I think the ethics uh, overall have changed. Uh, 
that they, been, they didn't teach ethics back when I came, started, mm -hmm. came to the bar in 51. Uh, you had ethics. You'd already been taught ethics. Uh, now, there were always someone who was going to be unethical here and there because that was their life, that was what they were, where they were brought up. But uh, uh, you know, a lawyer's word was his bond. And I think this example of these, uh, my two senior partners uh, living for 19 years over one bank account with three entities. Uh, and there was nothing in writing that we'd settle up every year or that every five years or if we ever disbanded, we would settle up and make, a, and make uh, cash arrangements. Nothing was ever said. Uh, and we dealt with each other that way. Uh, rarely did I, ever give, did I ever give a notice to take a deposition unless the attorney on the other side had, had proven by his conduct earlier uh, that he was not going to do anything by agreement. So I'd give notice. Or I couldn't get a deposition set. I couldn't get a case to trial. You didn't, you didn't go in and put out a motion to, to make the case, have the case be heard. Uh, same way with the settlement. Uh, and if the lawyer said so and so, said so and so was so and so, that's the way it was for the most part. You accepted that. Uh, and I think uh, they become more commercial, lawyers have. Uh, and I regretfully put the blame uh, for a large measure uh, before the U.S. Supreme Court that decided that lawyers and doctors, which were highly professional, could advertise. Uh, it's gotten out of hand. I, when you look at, pick up the Jackson Sun and see an ad, or the commercial appeal from Memphis, see an ad from somebody in Seattle, Washington, uh, saying if any of you had this particular medicine or had this injury or been involved with this product, you may have, some, have a lawsuit. Call this number, 800 number out in Seattle. I mean, that's, that's getting kind of out, of out of the range. And so I think all in all, it's just uh, having practiced for 30 years, uh, we're very rarely finding a, a glitch or a bump in the road because of, of some lawyer's integrity. They may not have been uh, Clarence Darrow's, but they had integrity. You stayed on the bench uh, as a presiding judge until 1998, is that right? No, in 95, oh, I, I retired from the, from, the, from the court in 95 on a Friday and on Monday became a senior judge. Okay. You, you apply for that job as, as, an, as a position and you okay. commit to do so much work a year. And how long did you stay in the capacity as a senior judge? Three years. Three years. Uh, are you, and, and at that point you retired completely? Mm -hmm. or, have you sat on the bench since then? Yes, I've okay. sat on, I've sat on several cases. Uh, we have a nice expression, we want you to sit as dummy. That means you can sit on a case and hear the case, but you won't have to write the opinion. Somebody else will write it. But, but you still it. join in in determining. Oh, yes, uh, but you just, you just don't have the responsibility of writing. Or you can say, uh, I'd like to write a couple of cases, and so you take the cases. They're always there for you to do that. Okay. So I've done that uh, on several occasions. Now, uh, just for purposes of information, Judge Holly Lillard, I believe you took your place, did she? Did she yeah, not? she took okay. my place. She was the first female, I guess, on the western section of mm -hmm. Court of Appeals. Mm -hmm. okay. Since you uh, left senior status or, se or being a senior judge, have you uh, practiced any law or, or been back into the legal field in any capacity? In a, in a, in a nice way. I have not practiced law. Uh, a young law firm asked me if I would come in as of counsel, and I've been there, and uh, they're so smart they've asked me very few questions. And I've attempted to do some mediation, but I have not done much of that. Okay. What, what do you think about uh, here about mediation? That's obviously a almost a cottage industry, so to speak, of, uh, that, that obviously wasn't in, in much in vogue when, when uh, even when you and I practiced together. What, what's your sense about the uh, involvement in the in the uh, uh, importance of ADR in, in our legal system? I think it's I think it's good. It, it needs to be watched. Uh, I think it's important. Uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky thing for non-lawyers to get into. Uh, I was surprised at how many non-lawyers that there are non-lawyers to that extent involved, uh, because I think you need your legal training uh, to know what to ask, how to handle the claim, uh, how to not manipulate, but how to bring the parties around to where they will agree. 
But I was surprised. I went to went to Duke for my mediation training, and uh, uh, I say this without criticism, but the Tennessee, uh, the AOC would not accept the the uh, ethical the two hours of ethics that I had at Duke. So I had to go before I got certified uh, under Rule 31. I had to go to Memphis and. Uh, get my two hours of ethics, which was part of a four-day, 30-hour, uh, 30 or 40-hour training session for these people who wanted to be mediators. Well, there were, not counting me, there were nine of us there. There was one other, one other person who was a lawyer. They had all different occupations before. I don't see how they can, can, can effectively mediate uh, with their backgrounds. Uh, without some legal training, uh, but I think it's going to be a, uh, an important, important thing, and, and it, it'll help relieve some of the some of the pressure on the dockets. I think, and if it's done right, uh, I know there are different ways of doing it. Uh, uh, some say you don't tell the, the parties what to take, and uh, that's where I was taught at Duke that you you just you, you work them around and let them decide. You don't say. Uh, Mr. Marino, this is a good settlement. You ought to take it. But uh, I think it's 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 it'll, it'll be it'll be helpful. Hewitt, you told me back when you hired me, and I assume this was probably, or maybe not when you hired me, but during the course of the time when I was an associate. And I'm assuming you probably said this to the other lawyers, although I hope you did. Uh, you said, when you get through, I want you to be a better lawyer than I am. Why was that important to you? Well, if you can't, if you, if you bring somebody along following you, and and, uh, and at the end of your of your work period or, or your time together, uh, uh, they're not uh, as good as you'd like to have them, then you haven't accomplished very much. Uh, and I, I feel like that, that what I said, uh, I said to the others, and what I said was true because all you guys are better lawyers than I am. Is there anything else you would like to say, Judge Tomlin, that, uh, for those who are watching this Well, video? I'm glad that I live long enough uh, and practice long enough that I would be asked to, to uh, uh, be on TV. I look forward to seeing it on uh, What's My Line, uh, uh, some other statewide program, but it's a, uh, at least I see I'm going to get uh, my compensation is going to be a, a copy of this tape that I will probably have duplicated and give to the, uh, my three sets of grandchildren. and, and then. Tell them I'll buy them tickets to the rodeo if they'll, re they'll watch it. Okay. Well, it's been a privilege and a, and a pleasure to interview you this afternoon. Well, Thank you for your it's time. It's been a real honor for me to be interrogated by someone like you. Thank you.